All right, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. On this episode, we have a very special guest, Tony Klaric. Uh, Tony is a legend and pioneer in the water sports community, having invented over 100 water skiing tricks and winning 11 national and world titles. Uh, for his 50th birthday, he accomplished the daunting task of water skiing on 50 different objects in one day, including an ice chest and a ladder. Uh, in this episode, we're going to hear about that, his Croatian heritage, and a special event he's putting on on the island of Vis. Uh, Tony, thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, it's so amazing to be here. Uh, you're real. I love your your sweater and uh, super excited for what you're doing and what we're going to talk about today. I appreciate that, Tony. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was just telling you off camera about the uh, sweater. I've gotten quite a few comments on it and it's really cool to wear around here in Zagreb. Um, you know, speaking of Zagreb, speaking of Croatia, you know, that's why we're here today. Can you tell us a little bit about your Croatian heritage? Well, it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, both of my grandparents on my father's side are from the island of Vis. Uh, they came out in the early 1900s. I think it was there was a wine disease at the time, so a lot of people left. Um, it's kind of cool because in 1976, when my parents took me on a tour of the United States, we actually went to uh, Ellis Island and saw their name in the book, which was pretty cool. And then on my mother's side, um, my grandmother on my mother's side, who's kind of the water skiing uh, connection, they were from Ljubljana. So, I mean, I guess you'd say I'm three quarters Yugoslavian, but one half Croatian now. So uh -huh. that's just like the basic uh, heritage that you would say. Uh, what was really important and what I love about the Croatian heritage is that it's so family oriented. And my entire time growing up, every Sunday without fail, I think from age zero to 15 or 16, my dad took me from Orange County to my grandparents' house in San Pedro. As you know, so many of the Slavs went from Croatia to San Pedro. There's a huge community there. And we went to grandma and grandpa's house, uh, Nona Hinona, every, every Sunday for years and years. So that's where I was really exposed to the importance of family, um, the heritage. My grandfather, when he first came over, was a cook on a fishing boat. And neither of my grandparents spoke English. So I was... Uh, you know, programmed, whatever you want to call it with the language. So I've definitely got an ear for it. Um, it does require practice though, which, you know, looking forward to that as we look to moving to the island. But during that time, uh, we'd have cousins come over and play the mandolin. So I, I just hear the refrain of, uh, you know, oh, Mariana uh, and all the, all the desserts. Um, and I have to thank you very much. I think uh, Andrea with the cookbook, um, I purchased that cookbook. You know, so you're having an influence out there. And when I opened this thing up, it was it was amazing because I saw six or seven things that my aunties and grandmother would make. And it like brought me back to that time and place with the rum balls, you know, and uh, and all the all the stuff with the walnuts and the, the little crispy ones with the powdered sugar. Uh, so we've been able to make a few here at our house and get my son in on it now to spread the generations. So. Um, just some great Sundays growing up, learning about the heritage, you know, Nona was always telling me about how I had to marry a good Croatian woman someday and, you know, all the typical stuff, you know, in her flower printed dress. And um, so it was a good relationship and I spent all that time with them. Um, and we just knew that the cousins, uh, the family, the sisters and brothers had property on Vs. So when it was my time in the seventies, that would, I would have been, uh, you know, teenager, uh, my dad took me to the island for uh, a couple of, you know, few weeks during the summer. And one summer, it's just you show up. And at that time, you know, one of the nicknames of Vis is the Forbidden Isle because of the military implications. Um, it was very difficult for outsiders to come and travel on that island. So at that time, it was just frozen in time. It was just as it would have been hundreds of years previous, other than, you know, some of the modern modernizations. But spent time there, you know, in the houses, in my grandfather's house, in my grandmother's house, got to see the island, got to swim in the beautiful blue seas and, you know, the, the sea urchins and the fish and all that stuff and, and eat the food. And so I really got connected that way. When we went back in 79, my dad actually bought a car in Germany, a Volkswagen, and we drove it from Hanover all the way through, you know, Ljubljana, Rijeka, um, Istria, down the coast. And all the way, you just drive it right on to the Yadrolinia Ferry, and the car went right on the island. Uh, we made all the visitations to my uncle's vineyards and uh, and visited, and then he shipped the car back. And I always remember 
the personalized license plate he had on that car for years was V79. So it was commemorated. And uh, my father was a longshoreman as I am also. So that was a big deal on the docks because there's lots of lots of longies from not just Croatia, but specifically from Vis. I probably know 10 to 15 people who have a lineage just from that island. It's kind of crazy. So mm -hmm. that that was my heritage. And, and that's kind of where it stopped. You know, uh, my grandparents died probably 20 or 30 years ago. And I, I was just pretty disconnected living my life as a skier, uh, first marriage, traveled a lot, but Croatia or Vis wasn't really something I super thought about. And that changed when I got remarried six years ago. The, it, everything just completely changed. It my, sense. How did that happen? Well, my uh, my current wife uh, loves to travel, loves adventure. And when she found out about the family home on Vis, it was, oh, we have to go. We have to go. So we actually got married in Greece. Um, and we were right there. So we flew to the island. We showed up. And this is the crazy thing. I hadn't been there since 1979. I didn't have the keys. I didn't remember where the house was. We just showed up and it's like, I think it's kind of over here. And because it was, I think, October and us not being aware of the fact that there's actually a tourist season over there, it was the very tail end of the tourist season. So no taxis. We found one place that was open, San Giorgio, and uh, they took us in. And now it's time to find the house. How are you going to do this? So we started with lunch at Poyota, a very famous restaurant there on the island. And uh, our waiter, Tonko, uh, we just explained to him while we were there. And he goes, oh, Kladich, Kladich. Yeah. Uh, and he he stands up. He takes his apron off right in the middle of, of, uh, of lunch. And he takes us to the uh, bakery. And he, he says, I, I think I know who has your key. So he takes us to the bakery. And we go around the corner and she doesn't speak English. So they're chatting back and forth. And she's like, oh, yes, I know who has the keys. So she makes a run. And then we go, we get the keys. And now we're there. We're going to get in the house. I see it. It's all coming back. And the only key she has is the keys for the shared courtyard. As you know, so many houses have a shared courtyard. And while I think my family owned the entire property at one time, we were down to one parcel of four in the shared courtyard. So the keys that she had were only to get in the courtyard, which was still very exciting. You found the house, you got in the courtyard, there's nobody there. Now, how are we going to get in? So we're kind of walking around, walking around. And uh, as we're looking over the fence, a gentleman walks up, can I help you? Which is, it's one of the things that's so amazing about the country is that people are so willing to go out of their way a few kind words and they just help you with, with anything. It's just so unlike what happens generally here. Uh, and this gentleman... Uh, Miho, he, like so many people, was born on Vis. He went away, he became a captain in ships based out of Monaco. And now he's come back and, and purchased the house and restored it. And he has the property that's basically uh, like Citrus Grove that's behind our property. So we tell him the story and he says, oh, I think I know who has the keys to your house. Meet me at five o'clock later. So we meet him on the stoop where all you know all the all the gentlemen kind of meet like it's like the the Google of old, right? All the uh, all the older statesmen of the island are meeting there, and he takes us there, and then he walks us up, and it's so funny because it's not like we're so used to just punching on the computer and, and getting the story instantly. It's like their Google is relational. You're you're talking to people and meeting with people, so we're, we talk to this person and that person, and they take us up and. He doesn't get on his phone. He calls up, hey, you know, so-and-so, you've got the keys. And they come down and then everyone comes down and there's a big, you know, group of people and there's the keys to the house. So amazing. Now we have it. And uh, we walk back to the house and we get in to the house for the first time. You understand my last aunt died in 1998. So this, and this was five years ago. So this is, you know, pushing 25 years. And it was such... Um, so many emotions going into that house after the first time, after having spent, spent, you know, part of my youth in the home. And it was just like somebody got up and left. You know, there was literally bowls with uh, spoons inside of them sitting there. And there was clothing laid out on beds and things hanging on doorknobs and pots and pans on the stove. It was like my aunts just disappeared. 
but now here's this house that's in the family and and we're excited about it but we don't know we don't really know what to do other than we've had this amazing experience on this magical island and uh when we left no taxis running so the the evo and uh, Navenka at san giorgio were so nice they literally let let us borrow their truck to drive from the parking lot to the ferry and when we got there at five in the morning they had packed us a lunch wow. you know a little breakfast to just say thank you and you know welcome home and we hope to see you again so nice but that's just what we found so many times over and over again so we're back home after first getting married and all the new stuff about that but now here's this house in croatia that's a family house that my wife is just encouraging me to go down the pathway of finding out about it. You know, my father has since passed. My uncle has now the, kind of been the caretaker. So we just went on the process of, of what's next. And what a journey that is, because it's not the USA. It is not California when you're over there. And, and we had a lot to learn, but we were willing and looking forward to to that. So that's basically, that's what got us on the island. And and that's, uh, that's where we were about six years ago. No, I, I have to say that's such a like classic sort of small town Croatia type of story, you know, that you just show up on Vis and you don't even know exactly where the house is located and you find it. And then, oh yeah, I know, ah, uh, Kladic, you know, everyone knows the last names of everyone in the village. And I don't, I don't know, that the story just hit home. Just like, that's a classic Croatian story. I mean, that's part of the appeal. That's a big part of the appeal, I think, to a lot of people and to a lot of us, you know, diaspora is that sort of connection with, you know, with the community over there. It's real. Your name in the community and the Nadamak also, which, you know, is the family name, it is important. That's what people want to know so that they can connect you to cousins and, and other people. It, it was crazy to me. We were renting a car in Split one time. When he saw the last name, he goes, oh, you're from Vies. <laughs> I'm like, we're at the airport in Split and you know where I'm from or where I'm going to based on my last name. It, it's just kind of crazy. But when you think about we found documents in the house from i think who's kind of the original founder and i believe he came from uh the the uh, venice uh, area because at that time you know the croatian coast was a venetian holding from like 1420 to 1800 roughly so it literally was venice and we found documents sound from perabonio in the eight early 1800s in this house so i know my family has been in this house since the early 1800s at a minimum and who knows on the other houses because we're just getting into it. So it's so excited to discover that history that people have, you know, will be able to help us through the churches and the network of people. Uh, so that was the start. Now we had to figure, what are we going to do about this house that's basically abandoned as so many houses over there? You know, it's uninhabitable, but it's in the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uncle said, well, you know, he remembers it in the days passed where it was a closed island and everything was so quiet. That's not what that island is anymore. Um, it's become a huge tourist mecca. And also because it was kind of frozen in time until after the Homeland War. I mean, I think a lot of people didn't really come until the late 90s and even early 2000s. So this island, I think more than a lot of the other islands, hasn't been developed with a big tourist infrastructure and a lot of like, you know, giant corporations that you'd recognize there's really nothing like that on the island it's just the stone houses and mom and pop shops all over the place and he says well you'll probably be bored you need to go spend a week to make sure that you're going to like it there so we came back and it was amazing uh the country and why i think it's so popular is it's discoverable uh here in the u.s we're so used to dialing up the internet and you can just plan your trip from start to finish and everything is known and there's no surprises. That country, it's like an onion. Sure, there's some people that do that, but it's so eminently discoverable that you can go to a place and not really, like we've tried to get, go to one of the national parks that's down, uh, is it Kurtka, the one that's that's by split? Mm -hmm. Couldn't find our way in. Like he just, just couldn't find our way in. You know, and then finally, by the time we figured out where we needed to be, it was too late, so we missed the tour. But same thing with Plivica. We went, and you just kind of discover as you go. And like other, you see a sign, and you stop. Um, so the country is discoverable, which is why I think so many people have been attracted to going there now. 
but the island especially even more so because of that lag of development. Every time we go back, we discover, oh, there's there was a Royal Air Force uh, airport on this island from World War II. Oh, there's a cricket field and an active cricket team, like the national cricket team is practiced there. Oh, there's um, restaurants in the interior, like just Fort George that's doing stuff. You, you just, it's not the mindset of the American and the mindset of the Croatian is so different that in America, everything would be up in big lights and this and that and discount today. We're there. It's much more relaxed. You just kind of discover as you go. So mm -hmm. that's been, that has been very different. So as we have all these adventures of travel and in the water and the sea, we're like, yeah, uncle, we, we want to go down this road. And he's like, okay. So on our next trip, we've probably been back 10, 10 to 15 times in the six years. So three times a year, COVID was a little tough, but so now he goes, okay, here's the properties. Well, I thought it was just grandma's house and a donkey house. Cause my uncle that was there, you know, rode the donkey to the fields. Oh no. He gave us a list of the cadastry numbers, which was like 20 parcels. You talk about the craziest, most fun scavenger hunt in the history. Not just that you have a home on this magical place, but now you get to go in the interior and find fields and, you know, use the Google maps and the, and the cadastry maps to try to figure out where and when, and where's this next one going to be such an adventure. Uh, I knew that my uncle planted grapes and, you know, pressed grapes. I mean, there was all the equipment in the Canova at the house, you know, the big barrels and all that stuff. So we knew he did it. And I had been there in my youth and ridden the donkey and all that stuff, but how are you going to find it? So it's the modern technology. You follow the thing. And we found over 200 old vines still producing fruit wow. that are on our lands. So then it's like, well, okay, now what do you do? Like it, we obviously someone's caretaking for these. So it's, it's your lands, it's your stuff, but someone else is caring for it. So you have to try to learn how to not be an American and say, oh, that's mine. I'm going to take it. No, you you work with the people to try to figure out what's going on and how you partner and, and what you do. And uh, one of the more exciting fields that we found was literally uh, we run into this kind of sustainable farm called Fields of Grace. And this Fields of Grace, um, basically, it's the same thing as this gentleman is probably in his 60s named Yaksha Kivala. And uh, he was born on the island. Went away to make his way in the world. You know, he went to the uh, the Far East and he became an expert in ho hoteling and uh, he was a Michelin chain uh, chef. So when he came back to the island in his 50s or 60s, he decided basically to open the sustainable farm and restaurant that's in the middle of the island. And, and when we discovered that one of the plots of land was in proximity to this and we discovered Fields of Grace, it's like, OK, we want to talk to this gentleman. Oh. He cooks a, an amazing seven course meal with wine that's made on the you know lands right there. And the whole thing is like 50 bucks, you know, for a seven course meal. Wow. And now we're in, you know, talking to this gentleman about, you know, that's my uncle's land. It's going to become mine someday. And let's figure out a way to partner on this. And uh, it's just been so exciting to to get those pieces and see how. Like some of them have not just the parcel of land, but then they'll have a small piece where you can build a building that's in conjunction with that. So um, as we move towards hopefully spending significant time in retirement there, um, there's just so many possibilities. So yes, uncle, we, we can take the, it's very exciting. We want to spend time there. And it just kind of kept going that we're going to rehab the house. And as so many people have done, do short-term rentals you know, at the house to make it worth their while. But uh, Croatia has a lot of surprises for you. It's not always what you think you're going to do. You know, Croatia is its own beautiful, lovely, different thing that you need to learn to adapt to. And you don't just go in there and rehab the house. It doesn't work like that. Um, you know, first there's, I don't know, 15 to 20 names on the property still since my uncle had been trying to get the thing, you know, in a, you know, narrowed down to the, the current people. And, you know, that, that's been an 18 year journey. Um, so finally that's been taken care of, but just to go through that has been exasperating and, and you don't understand, but 
Croatia is its own thing. You have to just, uh, somebody, one of the guys that talks about this is don't try to change Croatia. Let Croatia change you. And I think about that a lot. Um, I think that's real important as we come back, you know, at the diaspora, we're coming back to the country. We have ideas and it's good to have ideas, but you can't think that you're going to impose your feelings, thoughts, energies, biases on a country that's been surviving, you know, for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to yeah. say, I think you're going into this with the right attitude. I know a lot of people in the diaspora can probably, you know, agree and relate to, you know, especially property issues and, you know, trying to figure out who's who's and what's what and where is everything and all that stuff. It's never going to be simple. There's always going to be, you're always going to run into problems, be that with I mean, you know, bureaucracy, paperwork, not everything is, you know, like you mentioned earlier on a computer, there's going to be so many things and so many twists and, and turns, you know, on that um, journey that you're going through right now. So many pieces of the puzzle to fit together, which is also for you, I'm sure, you know, very exciting. You know, I think you said that before. And I want to get back to Vis um, yes. here at the end, but I do want to ask you quickly. Uh, but not too quickly about, you know, sort of the water sports before we get too, too far into, because um, I do want to talk a little bit more about Vis. I know you've got a wine tasting and art show that I want to hear about. But, um, you know, quickly, how did you sort of get into sort of water sports? And is it water skiing, water boarding? Not obviously not water boarding, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boarding. <laughs> well, it's been called water boarding, too. It's been called a lot of names because the boring name that fits the whole thing is toad water sports. Huh. And I mean, but even that doesn't fit now because we're branching into people wake foiling where you're not being towed anymore. So you're using the boat to surf behind the wave, either on a surfboard or on a surfboard that's got a hydrofoil underneath. So towed water sports isn't even the thing. So I think generally like the organizations will call it water skiing and wakeboarding kind of is the catch all that everybody understands, but mm -hmm. just the family thing. And that's on the Murphy side. That's my grandmother who's got the uh, the heritage from uh, Slovenia now. But um, so that family just grew up water skiing. So like I went with my dad to my other grandparents' house, I would go water skiing with my other grandparents growing up. I mean, since I can remember, we would just take trips to go skiing. And it just became a family obsession. And my uncles were really good at it. So. My uncle basically became an instructor and then he became a show skier at a very famous place called Tommy Bartlett's. Uh, Tommy Bartlett was a TV personality in the fifties, radio and TV personality here in the United States. And he ended up opening a theme park that then had uh, a water ski show. So my uncle Mike went to work for him and uncle Mike is a unique individual. He is not only became one of the best show skiers, but a brilliant inventor's mind. So along the way, he started inventing maneuvers. He kind of became the father of what they would call hot dog water skiing. So you have you ever seen like the snow skiers, what they would call hot dog snow skiing? It was kind of popular like in the 70s and 80s, you know, guys jumping and they do back scratchers. And it's just kind uh, of like a showy kind of skiing. They called they made movies on it and stuff. Well, he kind of became that person in water skiing in the 70s, and 80s. Now, I grew up thinking this was normal. I just thought, oh, that's just the way you ski because I saw him doing it. And also, I will have to admit that because I also saw that as a young, impressionable youth, I saw that the ladies were also very interested in the fact that Mike did really cool water skiing trick. And he always had very, let's say, hot girlfriends around. And I was like, yep, that's what I want to do. So <laughs> I, I followed in the family footsteps. And, and more than anything, Mike just kind of kept doing things and inventing things. And then I would step into that role. So he was a, he was, you know, a great show skier. I went and became a show skier at Magic Mountain in California. I know you're from LA. So Magic mm -hmm. Mountain used to have a show ski uh, site for about six years in the eighties. Huh. Um, I worked there. Mike invented the knee board, you know, that you, you've seen that device that you kneel down on. So he invented that in 1972. Well, then I learned all the, tr all his tricks. And then I started getting better than him, which he got a little mad about. But, you know, you, you got to let your baby go sometime. So then I became, you know, national and, you know, champion in wakeboarding. And then he invented the sit down hydrofoil, uh, commonly called like an air chair, sky ski. Uh, you, you sit down on this device 
And it's got a hydrofoil underneath. So you don't write on the board, you write on the foil. And this thing had a huge run in the 90s. Uh, extremely popular, you know, he was all over the place on, you know, TV news, traveled the world. I mean, he was in Playboy magazine on this thing, you know, Discovery Channel, commercials, everything. I, once he started doing the flips on that, which he's the first person to do a flip in like 1991 on that. Okay, that's the thing. So just kept following in his footsteps all the way. That's just what kept happening. And boy, he didn't like it better than him though. It was always like, even though he's an uncle, it was like sibling rivalry. You know, he'd have to, he'd have to every once in a while smack me down and show, no, the old dog's got tricks still. But when I think of him being old, he was like 40 something, which doesn't seem so old right now because I'm 58. <laughs> um, but we've, we've had a great time, a great run. He's still, he's still doing it. In fact, I'm going to meet uncle Mike. He's 74. He's still selling hydrofoils and on the road as a hydrofoil guy, not because he has to, because he loves to. I'm meeting him at our house in Florida this next week. We're going to do some filming on the history of hydrofoiling. So it, it's been huge. It, and then it was, you know, I did all this stuff. I, I had designed a kneeboard like he designed. It's the, the number one all-selling compression kneeboard. It's called the Joker by HO. Um, I was a professional, you know, on the road and traveling for 20 years. Did shows everywhere in the world, you know, had access. I mean, you don't make a ton of money as a skier. I mean, you know, it was, it was decent for sure. But just to be able to travel and to perform for, you know, Prince Albert of Monaco, to perform for, you know, I mean, lots of people, you know, presidents, vice presidents of countries, you know, prime ministers did it all through the years and got to see everything and uh, became, I followed in his footsteps of hot dog water skiing, was the first person to do a front flip on a slalom ski, which in 1986, that was a big deal. I mean, anymore, sports have gotten so extreme. Uh it's not like that, but at that time, just to do a flip on anything was a huge, huge deal because there's so few people doing it. Did great at kneeboarding, did great at sit down hydrofoiling. And then uh, as far as the skiing and kind of what it led to was my grandmother, who we talked about, her thing was always endurance skiing. Uh, we would go to Catalina. The family would go to Catalina for lunch or brunch. She'd ride her ski or hydrofoil to Catalina just to get there. 26 miles, open ocean. Wow. We're talking about in her 60s and 70s. So like most people, when it was time for uh, Grandma Murphy to have a ride, it's like everybody would hide because you know it was going to be a minimum of one hour in the boat. I mean, she was an endurance rider. And when Mike invented this uh, sit-down hydrofoil, he taught her how to ride it. She loved it. And it's a lot less pull. So she decided that she was going to start riding to Catalina on her birthdays at age 79. So every year from age 79 to uh, 88, she rode the sit down to Catalina Island and back for her birthday wow. celebration. Yeah. Crazy. So her ma her maiden name was Mikulich. So that's, that's the, the name uh, going back over there, but it became quite a thing. Like, you know, Ripley's believe it or not, did stories on her and she had uh, Guinness involved and like, new stations would film and they had the body glove boat out there. It became a big deal. So I'm like, when I was about to turn 40, what am I going to do? Grandma does this cool thing. And it just, you know, having a couple of beers with buddies, it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to ski 40 miles, you know? Oh, I could do that on 40 things. Are there 40 things? No, there's not 40 things. So hanging out with uncle Mike, we always tried different stuff. In fact, you think we invented stuff. The first list had 27 items, you know, slalom ski, kneeboard, trick skis, double skis, uh, jump skis, you know, sit down hydrofoil, like 29 items. Oh my gosh. I'm like, you know, how many short? Then I had to start getting creative and start asking people about old devices, new things, crazy things. And that's kind of where it started. So I just became obsessed with pushing myself, but also, again, doing something different. I just kind of got bored with uh, a barefooter, one of the world's best barefooters and often considered the world's best all-around skier of all time, Brett Wing, once told me, I go, Brett, why did you retire? 
Why did you retire from barefooting? He was the best. Nobody could beat him. He said, well, mate, I can't put any more water in my glass. Hmm. Like his glass was full. And that's, I just thought about that. Like after you went so many titles and championships, what's one more? You already know what's there. It's not anything different. You're sure it feels good, but it's not the same. So I just kind of kept jumping to sports to break new ground. And, and then it became how many things can you ski on? So that first 40 for 40 was tricky. I started going to garage sales and thrift stores and asking people and digging up the history on the sport and getting things that were written 50 years ago, 60 years ago and making things and just a cool journey that just kind of captured the amaz uh, imagination of a lot of skiers. And it, and it kind of kept me relevant because let's face it, you know, sports in general or young man's sport, how do you stay relevant if you're getting past 40 or 50? I became the historian of the sport and just started writing crazy stuff and, sh and showing the youngsters, okay, this is what it's done. Are you looking for a country with a stable economy, low unemployment, and a high standard of living? Then it's time to consider becoming a citizen of Croatia. According to recent data, Croatia has one of the fastest growing economies in Europe, with a low unemployment rate at 6.5% and a high quality of life. As a Croatian citizen, you'll have access to all of these benefits as well as a stable and secure country that's a member of the European Union. But the process of becoming a citizen can be slow, confusing, and overwhelming. That's why Citizen HR, the Croatian citizenship app, is here to help. Our experts can tell you what paths to citizenship or visas are available for you and connect you with an expert in under 10 minutes. One reviewer on the Google Play Store, Billy M, said, Easy to use. Quantity and quality of experts available. Great options for getting married overseas. So, if you're ready to take advantage of the many benefits of Croatian citizenship and live in a country with a stable economy, low unemployment, and a high standard of living, download Citizen HR today. Because at Citizen HR, we believe in the power of data and technology to make the process of becoming a citizen as smooth and successful as possible. So what are you waiting for? Head over to www.citizenhr.app today. Use the code ALLTHINGSCROATIA for 50% off any biography translations you order. So there's been something of a movement of a few guys now, which you see these guys writing things, you know, a snowboard or a, a table upside down. That's another thing I've written. You, you'll see guys writing this stuff now or just trying things that aren't normally written on. So uh -huh. that's well, been yeah, the journey. I mean, after the, you were talking about the 40 for 40, when you turned 50, you did 50 things. And I hear you're turning 60 in two years and you're going to do 60 different things in one day. Do you have any, uh, can you leak maybe one or two new items that you oh. plan to do? <laughs> Well, there's, there's no leak. I mean, it's just, it's just whatever is new and what, whatever I can think of. So, you know, the latest development and we're right in the thick of it because of the family connection to hydrofoiling um, is these wake foils. I don't know if you've seen them or not there. You kind of mostly see them in surfing right now. It's basically a surfboard or a wakeboard that's got a hydrofoil underneath it that you use to surf on the wave. So for us as boaters, you surf on the wave that's made by the boat. Well, they started in skiing, they went to surfing, they went to windsurfing, then they went to surfing, and now they came back to the boat. So that'll be a new item that I'm writing on. Um, there's just other devices that I have been seen made. There's this device that was made for barefooting back in the 80s that people know that I'm looking for stuff. They reach out and say, hey, I'm going to get you this device. Where do you want me to ship it? So and boy, all these devices that are supposed to make it easier, they don't always make it easier. Um, so that's been one new one, but just, you know, the standard stuff I'm working on writing the guitar, you know, wow. and the table and the pieces of wood and, and just kind of whatever is big enough to get your foot on is big enough. Uh, I try, have been trying to get a Guinness record for this situation and they, they've just turned me down because they say it's too specific. So in protest, one of the items that I always write is literally the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> Just to stick it in their face a little bit or what? <laughs> well, no, not it's not in your face. <laughs> I, I'm not like that. Just to kind of fun, like, okay, well, if you're not going to get me the record, here you go. This is yours is going to be one of the items. Yeah. Wow. So, so basically on any situation like that, what I do is I'll get up on a ski with my opposite foot forward. So normally I ride my stronger foot forward is right. I'll get up on a ski with my left foot forward, I'll have the book in my hand. And then once I'm skiing, 
I kind of have to perform a little bit of uh, gymnastics maneuvers to get the, the, the item, in this case, the book on my foot. So now basically I'm skiing with a ski on one foot and the book on the other. And then you kind of get the speed set just right. And then you kick the ski off. And now, hey, I'm writing the book. <laughs> how, how long can you stay like that? More than a few seconds or? Oh, anyone? that one? Oh, yeah. As long as I as long as I want to. I mean, depending really? on the item, it's I, I could ski a mile on that, you know, if the conditions oh. were proper. It's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, that technique has helped. There's a lot of guys doing stuff on, you know, paddles, oars, books, computer keyboards just like people just find random stuff and do it so uh i'm glad to have started a little something i guess yeah that's definitely cool i, I was watching i believe it was your 50 for 50 uh, video that you sent me and that i'll include um you know links down below for everyone to click on and watch if they want definitely looking forward for the uh, 60 for 60 and you know i want to go back to visa a little bit here at the end as we're down to the last uh, couple minutes or so um, well, first of all, before, you know, we sort of talk about the wine tasting and art show, have you been water skiing on Vise or do you plan on doing anything there? Yes, I have twice. So in my youth in the seventies, I did. And from what I understand, it was a big hit for a long time because I barefooted, I didn't have any ski equipment and someone rounded up like just some random piece of rope that they use. <laughs> and I was, you know, probably a hundred and some odd pounds. So the fishing boat went just fast enough. So I literally, they had, they lined up all the people on the Riva down there and I barefooted along the shore right there in the 1970s as a youth. And uh, my aunts just, they, they talked about that forever and ever, you know, but then they would get stuff because my, my uncle and father supported them for the years financially and, and letters. So they would be sending them the covers of the magazines and the posters and stuff like that. So when I got in the house, it was a trip because I just didn't think about I found pictures of myself as a kid all the way growing up and then stuff from my water skiing. So they were definitely proud, definitely proud. But the art show and, and the second time I skied was we just took a tour with some guy, uh, Davor. He's like Vise, um, Vise Adventure. He's on Milna on the other side of the island. And he's got a little like a boat that's fast enough. And, and uh, he had a wakeboard, which was a little too small for my style. I wrote it, but it was just wasn't me. But he literally had a wood pile out there. And I go, well, I'll just write on this piece of wood over here. So I pulled a piece of wood that was like about four inches wide by six feet long out of the pile and took a ride on the piece of wood. That was about <laughs> two years ago. Wow. So you're, yeah, you're but, already a, a local legend over there. Well, I don't know about a legend, but, uh, you know, the my attorney said when when we finally get back there, you know, in full force, that uh, he'll talk to the harbor master, and we're going to try to organize some sort of show in the harbor, like you know, Native Son comes home and do a show and all that business. So, oh wow, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So our Croatian adventure took a big turn. Here we thought we were going to rehab the family house, and all of a sudden we ended up, <laughs> to great surprise to everybody, purchasing a house over there. Um, this, it was such difficulties in rehabbing with the architects and the permissions and what we could and couldn't do. It's just been a process. And, and we have a, a girlfriend, Kathy, a friend who's a girl who she wants to join us in the adventure and help us. And she's wanted to help at the house and stuff like that. So she so much so that she's even dreaming of purchasing a home there. So on one of our trips that she's been with us, we went to look at properties and she loves Mama Mia like love loves mama mia and i don't know if you know or not but mama mia too was shot on the island so that connection is like very strong with her and we like stayed at the house that pierce brosnan stayed at and you know so there's all these amazing connections but uh so she's gonna she's gonna be at the house help us with our endeavors and she's gonna be like the girl in mama mia who's you know on a house in a foreign country you know it's so exciting and we're looking for her but the the um the real estate guy goes, you know, I got this waterfront one I think you guys should see. And I'm kind of like, ah, oh, no, we got appointments. Let's not. And we walk into this place. And as you know, it's difficult to find one-to-one -one properties and it's difficult to find properties that are done and ready to go. And with all of our difficulties, it's like, here's this house. And it was listed in January. So nobody knew about it. And we were there at the right time in January. So we make a run at this house and it's on the, it's literally on the Riva, on the water and coot right there. And we just don't think it's going to happen, but we just keep going down the pathway and about halfway through. Oh, by the way, nobody knew that this is a national historic monument. Like you have to get permission from 
the city of Vis split the county and the country to buy it. So like, oh, here's another obstacle. Then Ukraine war happens and you think like, oh, that seems awfully close. It's just so many obstacles, but it ended up taking nine months. We took control of this property in uh, September, the Villa Machiavelli. It's on the Riva in Coote. And this is where the art show story comes in. So we have met a couple from Zagreb. They're, they're right there in your hometown. And uh, we met them touring in, um, in uh, Amsterdam, I think. And I just, I recognized, you know, a few words and I recognized the voices. So I go over and chat them up and we have, we have a drink and then we meet up and we've since met in various places all over the world with them. And she's, um, she's an art lover. Her, her family's home in Zagreb was the center they were the salon uh, for decades and decades. So all the top artists came. She grew up with the top artists coming to her house. There's paintings from these artists in the house. Um, and it's just, it's special. She knows a lot about it. And as I was telling, him, telling her about this house, when I was driving back to the split airport, the thought came to me, if we get this house, we're doing an art show at the house. I, I've done lots of shows for skiing. The fact that this was going to happen just came to me like just a, a vision. I get th these pictures in my head. And when we got the house, I, I was just joking with her. Are you ready for that art show? And we just kind of laughed about it like you're crazy. Well, our first day in the Villa Machiavelli, I literally, an elderly English gentleman comes kind of wandering in. Where's the owner? We want to invite him for drinks. We have the house on the other end of the Riva. So we're like bookends, come over for drinks. So we come over and it ends up that um, his wife is Ivana, uh, Ivana Mestrovich, the granddaughter of the famous artist, right? Wow. Like crazy. And I, I guess we passed the test because after, you know, hanging out and drinks and they had some friends over, she goes, oh, let's go to the gallery. So literally, it's like Yaksha Palace is the place where they live. It's many rooms. And the, the gallery, it's a private gallery. And the works that are in there are the works that Yvonne used to make the famous works. So it's like, I don't know what you call them, the practice works or whatever. Mm. So he has one very famous one in uh, in Chicago. I think it's called The Archer. It's a big, you know, it's like a, an Indian or someone with a you know bow and arrow. And this thing in real life is, is gigantic. Well, the one in the gallery is only like, you know, three feet tall. Huh. And, and Job and like all these famous works that you know are there in the gallery. And she's kind of talking through each one. And, and at some point, I had only talked to her for five minutes the whole night. She's just being the perfect hostess. And she's speaking over uh, Job, which is one of his very famous works. And I go, wow, Ivana, that must be so hard for you. You're the caretaker of all of this. You know, you're the, you're carrying on the legacy. And this work is so rooted in suffering, which it really is. When you see it and you you feel you feel that struggle of the Croatian people that, that comes through this art. And she says, it's a burden that I gladly bear. And I'm like, wow. And I go, Ivana, this is the craziest thing. But I dreamed that I would be having an art show on the island. And she turns without hesitation and she said, you can have it here anytime you want. Wow. And we locked eyes and we like stared at each other. And this has never happened to me with another human being in my life. This was inexplainable. We were like looking into each other's soul for like 30 seconds. Everything else went away and we both got kind of emotional, like we weren't speaking. And when we came out of it, my wife goes like, whoa, what was that? And I go, I, I, I don't know. And I go, Ivana, did, did you, I, we didn't, cause she came to our like open house party and I go, did you feel that Ivana? She goes, yeah. And I go, what was that? She goes, I don't know. And I go, I, I think that means we're supposed to be doing stuff together. She goes, yeah, we are. So to literally on the first day that you're like, have a residence in the country that you can, we are always Airbnbs. The first day that you have a residence in the country, you meet the granddaughter of the artist when you're claiming you want to do something around art. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and then because of the legacy with wine, I just think we want to try to set something up with, um, with wine and wine tasting, because when people come to the Island, 
oftentimes it's on the boats or you can't really get to the interior. So you're kind of just stuck. You don't really get to see what's happening. And um, there's not really places there that cater to supporting all the different wineries. There's lots of great wineries, but it's like so many things in Croatia. There's not ours. You got to know somebody. You can't just get in your car and drive there necessarily. So we want to kind of try to bring that to the people. So uh, when we come uh, to uh, Zagreb and the island in May, we're going to be meeting with Ivana on the island and trying to plan this for September. So we don't really know exactly what it's going to be, but we we have an offer of a place to hold it. We have a person who's an expert in art. We have a history in wines. We don't know what, but we just keep following this pathway. And, and we know we get support. I ran into a cousin that's producing wine out there and he's just so excited about it. So we, we think there's something there and we're going to, we're going to do it all within hopefully doing it right because my legacy is the island. There's a lot of people moving in there and it's kind of sad that the, the country and the islands are getting gentrified. Like it's, it's true. It's really happening. And yeah, I'm there too, but I probably have deeper connection because I am from the island. You know, my heritage for, is from that island, 50%. Um, it's different for me. I'm not just there to make a buck. Yeah. You know, you want to, share your your home with people but not at the expense of just making money um you want to do it in a responsible way so we're just looking forward to it and i'm so hopeful and i'm so thankful for you and what you're doing so i reach out to any one of the people that are here listening that are in a position to help or get involved with this journey that we're on or maybe we can cross promote with something that you're doing my wife and i are here we're we're applying for citizenship and thanks again for what you're doing with the the app that's going out um we had to do ours with the lawyer and with adriatic travel helped tremendously by mm -hmm. the way that's another sponsor of yours but they helped with our translations and they were very helpful but uh that's another whole story of the citizenship but we we hope yeah. to partner with people that are that are doing this stuff so we can do it responsibly and get with people that maybe have a little bit more of our mindset and to figure out how to approach this in a way that's that's beneficial, but that doesn't just put the dollar it, like Americans do, that the dollar is the almighty be all and end all, because that's not what this country is all about. You know, mm -hmm. it's just much deeper than that. Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, that's a big, you have a big responsibility with, you know, a gallery like Meshtrovich's. Yeah, know, no kidding. I didn't know that they, I guess that makes sense that, you know, sculptors have this sort of first edition or first sort of attempt at something before they make the big one that I guess I never really thought about that but yeah that's a huge I mean that's super exciting I'm really excited you know to hear more about that I want to thank you you know for taking the time Tony to come on the podcast I'm really happy to hear that you know the podcast has connected you with so many you know different people with the recipe books with you know the sponsors that have been on the podcast you know that's really for me awesome to hear that um you know that it's doing something it's connecting people connecting the community um, I'll, I'll post, you know, all the links that you'd like, you know, your email or, you know, whatever, so people can get in contact with you if they want to help out, if they want to hear more about, you know, what you're doing. Um, even, you know, as far as the wakeboarding and water skiing, if they want to check out some of the videos, they want to follow you for when you're going to do that 60 for 60, which I'm also excited for, although I know you've got a couple of years left. But uh, overall, you know, Tony, I just want to thank you again so much for, for coming here on the All Things Croatia podcast. It's been amazing. Do you mind if I asked you just a couple of quick questions? Is that <laughs> sure is that allowed? Not. Well, uh, I, I've so I would wonder like how does the how do you see the podcast and what you're doing having an effect on the diaspora? Uh -huh. What you've got to see something. What do you how are you seeing that happen? Because you're obviously finding success. Yeah, I mean, I see it in cases you know much like yourself. How you mentioned, oh, I I bought the the book of you know Andrea Pisatz, um, which yeah, that was one of my first maybe first five episodes that was a long time ago um that that one went out things like that you know people will message me oh I, I just listened to this episode with you know whoever that was so amazing you know I didn't know about this or I'd never heard about you know this before um you know so that's always really cool to hear that people I've had a couple people meet up two different people in Australia that I had at separate times on the podcast ended up connecting with each other and meeting uh, so that's always really cool. Uh, just things like that, just things where I'm seeing the the episodes have an impact or the, at least they've enjoyed the content behind it. 
or they've made a new connection or discovered something new about Croatia or, you know, their Croatian heritage. And for me, that's, I mean, that's, that's the goal of the podcast. And that's the whole point of, you know, sort of why I'm doing this. Well, that answered my second question, because I wondered what your goal was, because it's not often that a, a you know, a, a young guy with you with a lot of energy, like, does this. I mean, this is a huge labor of love, and I'm so appreciative. So thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the time. I hope to see you in Zagreb soon. And, and I invite you to our villa. I invite you to Vis. And, and anyone who's listening, I invite you to connect with us. And, and let's do exciting things that are important. You know, that's that's yeah. my goal. Wow, well, Tony, thank you so much for for the kind words and for interviewing me a little bit for once. Uh, thanks again, Tony. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Take care.